Good evening, everyone. I'm just confirming that you all are hearing me. I'm hearing you. Yeah, just fine. All right, awesome. So thank you so much for joining us for this session this evening. I am Nicole, engineer Nicole Burris, the treasurer for Apex Mechanical Division. And I, myself, along with Mr. Les, engineer Leston Betelemy, will be the moderator, moderators for this evening's program. So before we begin the presentation, I'd like to remind you guys of basic chat room etiquette. You know, while the presenter is speaking, um, you are reminded to mute your microphones, um, but you are also free to post your questions within the chat. And during the question and answer segment, our moderator, engineer Leston Betelemy, will entertain them. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this evening's speaker. Is Mr. Christopher Bonai. So he has 18 years experience in maintenance, 15 years experience in machine diagnostics, and he has certifications in vibration analysis, as well as thermography, lubrication, ultrasound, and electrical analysis. He is, um, as you would have heard, you know, has expertise in the condition monitoring um, field, and he actively reviews the content of the Mobius Institute as well as the ICML. So his goal is to support upcoming as well as um, experienced engineers in the field of machine diagnostics. So without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Mr. Christopher and I. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for that um, wonderful uh, introduction. I just um, like to confirm that everyone can hear me right now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you all see my screen right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So good night, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this uh presentation, or at least participating in this presentation on um maintenance and diagnostics of uh industrial cooler fans utilizing vibration analysis. Um, I chose this topic particularly um industrial cooler fans because I believe is one of the least understood assets within the industry. So I hope to demystify some of the um. So many problems that you all may encounter or you all may notice or so many reoccurring problems that you all may have, right? So um, with that being said, let's begin. All right. So I'll just go through here the content with you all that um, I will be going through tonight. Um, the common uh, design uh, configurations and applications, right? The cooler fan construction, that's a basic um, cooler fan construction um, um, session. Um, the fan blade design and aerodynamics, right? So it is going through just the typical fan blade design and how it establishes airflow. Um, fan maintenance, the checks and failure modes. So some of the checks that um, will be associated with uh, the cooler fan, the operational um, efficiency, the reliability to ensure um, optimum reliability and so on. And some of the common failure modes that you may encounter. Um, the Cooler fan vibration signatures, right? So that's all the different fold modes you can detect via uh, vibration analysis. You have on balance, gear wear, belt, belt wear, aerodynamic flow issues, and so on. And um, I have a case study at the end on um, on a synchronous belt defect that was detected on the belt drive system on one of the fans that I assessed in one of the offshore uh, facilities. So let me begin by um, just going through these uh, basic design configurations. It's really uh, uh, two different um, uh, design regimes that um, establishes flow uh, through this um, cooling fan or through the cooler system, right? So on the left here, you have the induced draft. Um, the fan, these, these fans are usually mounted above the tube bundle, right? You could almost watch it 
and you form something like an extractor fan, right? It actually pulls the air through the tube bundle and expels it out. On the right, you have the force draft. That actually, you could watch that more pushing the air through the system, right? Pushing it through the, the plenum and um, up through the tube bundle. Here we have the uh, cooling tower design configuration, right? Again, you have the induced draft and force draft for the cooling towers as well, right? As well as the ACC, which is the air cool condensers. Is the cooling tower design slightly different, but the fan itself, the fan makeup itself, would not really uh, change. So on the left here, we have the induced draft cooling tower. This is probably the more typical design that you'll see throughout the industry, at least from what I've seen. And um, the same thing, you know, the it pulls the air through the system and extract the heat out on top um, as vapors, right? Um, the force draft, no, uh, um, I use uh, the blowers to force the air through the system and out and expel out on top. Here is the um, more the structural um, makeup of the coolant fan itself. So you have the fan itself uh, surrounded by the shroud, right, or the fan ring. You have the plenum that encapsulates everything, right, that come like the shell that holds everything and secures it. Um, the structure itself, um, and you have the header, the header for the, the uh, cooler itself, uh, where process fluid enters, whether it's um, you know, hot process fluid or gas or so on and so on. Here's our next uh, cooler fan construction. This one is a induced draft type, right? You also have your header and nozzle inlets and outlets here. Um, this design, well, at least it, through the illustration here, you can see it's a right angle drive design. You have various um, designs. It could be a right angle gearbox. It could be a direct drive. It could be a, a parallel gearbox and so on. Right, so I'll go through the blade design and some of the aerodynamics associated with it. Some key points, right? The fan, the geometry, the fan blade itself, it has a rounded edge that we call a leading edge. It has a thinner edge, a sharp edge, we call it trailing edge, right? The airstream enters the leading edge, rides along the contours of the aerofoil and exits at the trailing edge, right? Now, the, the direction which the trailing edge curves is the direction of the airflow. So if you look at the, the illustration on the right side, right, you see the direction of the airflow, right? That is up where curving on the trailing edge, right? It really works as an aerofoil and it establishes a differential pressure between the top and bottom of the blade. And that differential pressure now establishes airflow axially, right? We're only dealing with axial flow fans there. There's uh, radial flow centrifugal fans as well. It's not those, those are the, the blowers, right? What we're dealing with is mostly the, the, the axial flow fans. Right, um, this is two, uh, two design constructions here to illustrate the importance of the inlet bell, right? The inlet bell has a curvature for a distinct reason, and that gives uh, greater flow efficiency coming into the fan itself and um, expelling out, right? Without that curvature and without that flow efficiency, now we tend to have vortex in at the tips, right? So it's a region of high velocity and low pressure at the tips there. Therefore, if you don't have those um, that curvature on the inlet bell, you would have uh, air loss or air leakage at the tips. So it is important to, to have your um, inlet bell design this way. All right. So, um, so many fan maintenance uh, considerations and checks, right? So so many things to consider when you're um, doing any maintenance check on a fan. The blade tip clearance, that is important, right? That is important for flow efficiency. Um, if it's too wide, you would also have uh, air loss at the, at the blade tips as well, right? So important to have a, a relatively tight clearance to produce the, the most efficient airflow. Pitch angle adjustments, that is important as well for optimum airflow, right? If your pitch angle adjustment is, uh, if the angle attack 
angular factor right is too uh shallow it may not get that airflow that they want if it's too steep you'll get um, something called stall and you could get airflow separation it wouldn't get efficient flow as well so it have an optimum uh pitch angle adjustment that you want to work with the blade tracking right that the body blade tracking is is really the that is a measure of how each blade um, rotates on the same plane, right? With blade tracking, now if you have poor blade tracking, that would mean that some blades might dip lower than others, and some might be a little higher. You don't want that. You want all on the same rotational plane. Um, retention socket, push and wear, right? So um, some of the larger fans, not all have it, they have different designs and so on, right? You have an upper hub plate, you have a lower hub plate. In between has a retention socket. And the shank of the fan blade um, is inserted into that socket. That socket might have a bushing, right? Sometimes that could be worn. That could affect the tracking as well. Um, the fan bearing wear. Well, that is obviously a common issue that um, and a recurring issue that you're always dealing with, and mostly attributed to you know contamination and lubrication issues and so on. Um, belt wear and pulley alignment, right? So that is for the belt driven configurations. Um, gearbox wear, also a, a, a common fault mode that you may encounter, right? I will show how all these could be de detected through vibration analysis in later slides. Um, right, so I just going through some of the consequences now of improper uh, blade tip clearance. You have improper axial flow, um, increased air loss or air leakage around the tip. All these Issues kind of, you know, in it, it tie into each other. Um, increase energy consumption, um, increase blade stress, uh, noise and vibration, right? Uh, with excessive uh, clearance or blade tip clearance, they tend to have um, a lot of turbulence at the tip of the blade, right? And that creates a lot of noise and vibration and so on. Um, you have potential for blade damage as well. That really uh, mainly apply if you have too tight of a clearance. So if you think about if you have too tight of a, of a blade tip clearance and you have um, an unbalance, right? That orbital motion that the unbalance might um, might induce could actually cause the tip of the blade to touch the shroud and you don't want that. Improper or inconsistent pitch angle adjustments, right? Some of the consequences of that, reduce aerodynamic efficiency, decrease cooling capacity because uh, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want it adjusted uh, too, shallow of an angle, right? You'll get improper airflow. Um, increase energy consumption. Now, you can increase your angle of attack to get more airflow, but the trade-off to that is that you get more uh, amperage demand of your motor, and that um, could cause some motor overload, right? So you would realize that, um, yes, you're getting more airflow, but it's more load of the motor, so it's a trade-off. Um, aerodynamic load imbalance. So if you imagine that one blade is angled differently from the rest, that trying to push a different volume of air from the rest of the, the um, other fan blades. And that is a kind of a pull and tug situation there, right? You have, it's important to have that distributed, well distributed airflow so you have proper load balance. And um, that is potential for blade damage as well, right? Because one blade could be under more stress than the rest of them. Improper fan blade tracking. Well, you have uneven airflow distribution, uneven load distribution, structural fatigue, right? Because remember, one blade could be dipping um, more than the rest, or even elevated more than the rest. And once that turning now, and the rest of the blades in line or in proper alignment, but that one out of out of alignment could cause some structural fatigue. Right. Um, there are some of the standards that govern uh, fan design performance and maintenance requirements, right? Um, you have the API 661, the yeah, cool heat exchangers for general um, refinery service. That actually gives guidance on the blade to clearance. Um, specifically, that one I have more knowledge of than the rest, but um, you could refer to the rest as well, right? Um, the API 661 also gives guidance on, um, on the vibration levels, the vibration limits, right? Um, so if you want, you could either, you could wait for the recorded presentation, or you could print screen this right now if you want. 
Right, so uh, this document here outlines a procedure, a simple procedure on how you go about uh, checking the um, blade pitch, the tracking, and we call the fan blade sweep. So if you watch the blade uh, pitch adjustment, right? He has, they call it a protractor, but what it really is, why it's called is a, is a inclinometer, right? You mount the inclinometer one inch from the blade tip, right? And what you might want to do is um, loosen the bolts at the retention socket and have someone probably use a rubber mallet and kind of tap on the any blade and try and get the blade to the appropriate um, pitch angle adjustment. The inclinometer no one would read the pinch angle. And you do that with each blade and you make sure it's consistent and uh, to the OEM spec. Uh, blade tracking. So what the guy doing here, he's tracing the contour of the blade onto the shrug. That you do with each blade. The first one, you can also mark it as well. So you mark blade one, you mark the contour and you name it one. You go to blade two, you oval, if you want to get overlap it or slightly um, offset it, right? So you overlap that on the blade two and so on and so forth, right? At the end of it, you should get a, a track in that within half an inch, which is the lowest value to the highest value, or the highest, the upper uh, contour to the lowest one, at least a half inch. And that is a, a ruler thumb. And then the fan blade sweep. So you, you measure from the trailing edge to the trailing edge, or it could be from the leading edge to the leading edge, and uh, they should be uh, at least within one inch from each other. These are just simple ruler thumbs. All right, the vibration analysis 101, right? So that's going uh, through the, that's the FFT process. That's where you have a basic understanding of how vibration works, right? So you start off with a, a complex waveform, and what the FFT algorithm does, it extracts from that waveform its individual uh, sinusoidal uh, components, right? Or frequency components, individual waveforms, right? Each waveform might have a, a separate frequency, and you map that out on a, a spectrum, which is a measure of um, amplitude versus frequency. So you could see on the illustration in blue there, it map out all the individual frequencies. Right? And you use that, those pattern of those um, individual frequencies for vibration analysis to assess the machine. Right, um, some of the other signature patterns to consider. You have harmonics and sidebands. So you have harmonics. Harmonics is integer multiples of a fundamental frequency. So in the top graph here, right? For example, you have the running speed at 1500 RPM. That 1X that you're seeing here, represents that 1500 RPM by the form of a frequency. You know, in the vibration world, we wouldn't say, well, that 1500 RPM will translate a signal at 1500 CPM, right? Or you could convert that to, to hertz. Um, that would be 25 hertz, you divide by 60. 1500 divided by 60, 25 hertz. So you have harmonics of that, that is multiple. So let's say uh, 1500 CPM, the two X will be 3000. The 3x would be 4,500. So there's important um, signature patterns to recognize because it could indicate a, a problem in, in most instances. Sidebands, what are sidebands? Sidebands are these equally spaced frequencies around a main frequency of interest that you're looking for, right? And it's equally spaced on the plus and minus side, right? As you can see in red. That also indicates a problem. In this example here, the purple peak represents a gear mesh frequency, which is one times the gear mesh fre frequency, which is the number gear teeth times the RPM, right? The sidebands here represent uh, the one X RPM of the pinion shaft. So what that indicates in there, there's a problem with the pinion gear. If it was the one X RPM of the output gear, it would have been an issue with the output gear. So that's how you know. You will see these patterns in other analysis that or some of the data that will be going through. All right, some of the common fault modes associated with vibration analysis. We have fan and balance. I uh, hope that all you could see this graphic here. I'm not sure, you know, sometimes the all internet, I don't know if the internet uh, access they have would be sufficient enough for you to see this graphic here, but 
this is the actual motion you would see when you have a fan on balance. Some fans, when you actually look at it, is the actual motion that you would see. It's actually quite accurate. Um, so you have a dominant 1x vibration signature. That is the, the vibration signature or the, at the rotational frequency, right? Or the rotational rate. Um, you'll get a phase shift on 90 degrees between the X and Y sensors, particularly at the top of the fan, top fan bearing. What I mean, what that really means is that um, if it was to transform the vibration pattern into a waveform, a sinusoidal waveform, those two waveforms would be phased at 90 degrees, right? The two, nine, two sensors at 90 degrees to each other would actually be phased at, um, at 90 degrees relative to each other. You would have an amplitude ratio of one to one or one to two. So the X and Y sensors, the signal, the one X signal you would get from them would have uh, very similar amplitudes. And I'm gonna show that here right now. So there's actual vibration data, right? This is our fan on balance that I encountered. The X sensor on top, the Y sensor below. The X sensor reading um, around close to 13 mils, Y sensor close to 18 mils, right? So that's showing in between our one to one or one to two amplitude ratio. Aerodynamic airflow issues. Well, I'd mentioned that um, before concerning the blade tip and the pitch angle adjustments and so on. So one of the signature patterns that you'll see with that is a dominant uh, we call a blade passing frequency which is, num which is the number of blades by the fan rpm um, sometimes it's present in one axis dominantly more than the other maybe either x or y and I, maybe as a result of inconsistent shouted blade tip clearance and or pitch angle adjustment even tracking is used as well so anything that causing flow disruptions Right, this is an example here. Um, there you see the X probe on top, the Y at the bottom, the X showing a dominant blade passing frequency. You could see here at the, you'll see at 5X, there's actually at 5X here, right? The the Y probe not really showing anything much. So it showed that it's predominantly more in one axis than the other. Gearbox issues, right? Um, there are many different gear faults. That you could detect with vibration analysis that is going through the basic um, general guideline to, to follow that you know that something is wrong, right? If you're looking at the vibration data and so on. You'd have a dominant gear mesh frequency, which is the number of gear teeth times the shaft RPM with numerous harmonics and sidebands. If you recall earlier, I was talking about the harmonics and, and sidebands. Um, the first gear mesh peak can be higher than its harmonics when it have excessive to load if it, the system under a lot of load. The severity of gear wear can be directly correlated to increasing or increased number and amplitude of corresponding sidebands. The more sidebands you see, that is a bad sign. The higher the amplitude of the sidebands, that is also a bad sign. That So it shows you that you have some sort, a lot of deterioration going on there, right? Um, how high amplitude gear mesh time intervals can also be seen in time waveform data. We also have the time waveform data that um, you could view for for gearbox faults as well, right? Right. So this is a actual um, gear fault issue that uh, encountered. If you notice from it, you're seeing a numerous harmonics of the gear mesh frequency, and you also see numerous sidebands as well, right? All right. Um, yeah, we have the resonant issue of the uh, vertical assembly. When I say vertical assembly, I mean sometimes you have configurations where you have a large motor mounted on a gearbox, right? So it's basically like a vertical cantilever, right? These could pose problems in that it could have resonant issues associated with it, which is a, a more of a structural issue or structural response as well, right? Is have a, it could have a dominant 1x or dominant blade passing frequencies. Those are the two common frequencies that you tend to see if you have a resonant issue because they usually dominant frequencies, right? And um, a resonant issue occurs when the forcing frequency that you're dealing with, whether it's the 1x vibration or say the blade passing frequency, matches with the natural frequency of the system, right? Um, but
but it can occur at any excitation frequency ready, right? But those two tend to be more dominant because those are dominant frequencies. And if it coincides with those frequencies, then they have amplification. Um, they're mostly unidirectional. Therefore, may be more present in the X direction opposed to the Y or vice versa. So you tend to see a resonant issue um, typically in one axis more than the next because is re resonance is really a function of uh, uh, stiffness and damping. And um, sometimes one axis could be more stiff than the next. So it tend to be more compliant and sometimes the less stiff region, for example. And can, can be confirmed via a simple bump or impact test. So what that is, for example, the impact test, because I data I want to show um, just now here. Um, we use a hammer with a load cell on it, right? And what that does, that measures the force of the impact. And you also, we mount an accelerometer at that same location. And that accelerometer will measure the frequency and amplitude along with that force that being imparted. Right, and, and that will confirm my resonance. So here now, um, in this illustration, um, Uncle Bob. <laughs> so Uncle Bob moving the the, the structure, right? The base of the structure. He exciting these vertical members here. These would represent the vertical assembly, like I was talking about, the motor uh, mounted on the gearbox. Depending on the frequency with which he agitate that base, he could excite each one of those in different ways, right? It all depends on now, your intuition might tell you, well, the tallest one is the least flexible and is the most compliant one, right? That one will be most easy, easy to, to get a response of, but not necessarily. Sometimes it all based on um, how well that, or how close that uh, natural frequency matches with the excitation force that he's applying. So here is um, actual data that are acquired. On top is our spectral data from the top of the, uh, the motor for this fan that, um, that run in the gearbox as well, right? The, the motor, the gearbox, the fan. So you have a dominant 6x. It actually had six blades. So this is a dominant blade passing frequency that we see in here, right? The graph at the bottom illustrates a, what we call a frequency response function. That is in units are mils per newton. So remember when I tell you about that, uh, the force hammer, when I mentioned the force hammer, that is the data that it would produce. The yellow dot represents the uh, frequency with which the blade fa passing frequency was uh, detected at, which was around 10 hertz. The actual uh, natural frequency lie around nine or well, above nine, nine hertz here. So it's fairly close. So that would suggest that this, High amplitude here is due to a partial resonant issue, right? If if indeed the blade passing frequency was had much that frequency that on the on the FRF um, function, if it matched exactly to the peak, that would have been high amplification. So here's a uh, next illustration here that I show that um, the Peak resonant frequency 9.2 hertz and the blade passing frequency 10 hertz. They're actually fairly close. So it did show that the blade passing frequency was somewhat amplified um, because of this. All right, um, fan bearing issues, right? You tend to have a dominant non, you tend to have non synchronous peaks present in the FFP spectra. Right. Um, when I say non-synchronous, that is um, non-integer multiples of the running speed frequency. So, for example, especially in fan bearings, they tend to get so many higher orders. You get um, like, for example, I put 10.32x, 12.67x. Those kind of um, odd figures you'll get. It can be a result of uh, inner race defect, outer race defect. Uh, ball or roller defect, and even a cage defect, right? Um, can generate numerous harmonics and sidebands once the defect is approaching a more severe state. And I'm gonna show you that right now. Well, sorry, after this one, <laughs> right? So this um, this illustration here shows different stages of uh, bearing wear. 
right? Uh, for the most part, it's most noticeable at stage three, right? It have a special techniques that you can de detect it from an early stage, so many high frequency detection um, techniques. Then we'll start to, start to see some signs from stage two, but you really begin to see it or become noticeable at stage three, right? And that is especially where you should be uh, looking for. So here uh, shows a typical stage three defect, right? For a fan bearing issue. Um, here, right, the orders is 13.14 orders, 13.14 X. As you can see, you have numerous harmonics and sidebands. And what should the amplitude of these sidebands here? So it shows you that this bearing is a, in a deteriorating state. It has to re be replaced ASAP. Fully alignment issues, right? Um, these tend to then to, um, display a dominant 1x peak, specifically in the axial region, right? So when you have um, the misalignment, it tend to um, create an axial force, right? Sometimes it um, can display a higher amplitude of the driven along the driver axial region or vice versa, right? So if it is that the majority alignment is on the driver side, you would actually tend to see it on the axial region on the driven side, vice versa. <clears throat> Right here, um, you have a graphic of a eccentric rotor. In this case, it could be an eccentric pulley, right? Um, it also displays a dominant um, 1x, specifically in the radial direction. And this eccentric pulley that is basically when the center rotation is deviated from the geometric center, right? Um, usually, highest vibration is usually observed along through the center line axis through both pulleys. So if you watch the illustration at the bottom in a white, where it have the H here in the horizontal, and you see where it in line where the belt tension is, right? But in line with the center line of the boat body pulleys, that is where they say you will get the higher amplitudes at, right? Um, you could get a centric pulley by basically if you don't have the proper fit over the shaft, right? Um, and keyway and so on. They say you tighten up that that grub screw or the set screw, whatever. It could tend to push it off center. And it will uh, sort of simulate a eccentric condition. Beltway issues, right? Um, so you have a dominant um, belt rotational frequency accompanied by numerous harmonics. So the, the rotational rate of the belt, you tend to see a vibration frequency that matching that along with numerous harmonics, right? The two times belt rotational frequency is usually of higher amplitudes, actually. Um, for timing belts, right, um, or synchronous belts, as I say, right, where it can also be indicated by the belt timing frequency, which is the number of belt teeth by the belt rotational rate. Um, this here really um, is a formula for the calculate the belt frequency, right? Once you know you have certain inputs, like the pulley RPM and the pitch diameter, either one of the pulley RPM or the, on the pitch diameter. We need to know the belt length, right? Um, the time in belt frequency, I see um, the belt frequency rate or the rotational rate of the belt by number of teeth. It's very similar to like a gear mesh frequency. You could, you could watch it as a belt mesh frequency if you will. All right, um, I'll go through our case study here, right? Um, uh, uh, belt synchronous belt issue that I encountered, right? So uh, high elevated noise levels were observed on a cooler fan during a routine vibration analysis survey on an offshore installation, right? Um, the noise seemed to be emanating somewhere from the belt drive region, region from where I had observed. I hear kind of sort of growling tone, uh, somewhat of a high pitch tone as well as I was hearing, right? So I assume it was the belt, but I couldn't, you know, have to let the data guide me, right? So vibration data reveal multiple harmonics of uh, 4.24 hertz. If I had to translate that to CPM, that is 255 CPM vibration peak in the FFT spectra, right? Um, so I, had, I saw numerous harmonics of that. The nature of that 4.24 vibration signal had to be determined, right? 
if I could prove that that is the belt rate, then I prove that that is actually a belt defect that I encounter. So here's the vibration data it illustrated in numerous harmonics, right? At the 4.24 hertz, and the harmonics going all the way up to 20 something. This indicates a fairly advanced uh, problem, right? Um, there's the synchronous belt here. There's the X location where I took the data, the Y location, there's the bottom bearing, the X location at the top bearing, and the Y location at the, the top bearing as well, right? This is the X location, the bottom bearing. There's the data that I got. Right, so when I noticed that noise now, I went to the control room, right? I asked them to pull up the, the amperage, and I used to log it, right? I log it on my device, and I save it over the couple of months. And this one I noticed. It had a, a huge step change in the amps. The normal running amps was between 22 and 23 amps. This time around is around 26 amps, a three amp increase. That is actually quite a lot, right? So that um, indicates to me that this is a, a, a real problem that we're dealing with. So I went and acquired some vendor data, right? This is the drawing of the fan here, bottom bearing here, top bearing here, right? I knew the number of fan blades, it had six blades, fan RPM, 313. I got the fan sheave number, the motor sheave number, and the belt um, number. So the, the motor RPM was 1750. Now, not all the time that it will follow along these um, the vendor data will be slightly different, right? And from the data that I took, it was indeed a little different. So I will illustrate that later. So I just um, list out all the important um, pieces of information that was acquired. See so motor speed, fan speed, number of uh, blades, the motor sheave number, fan sheave number, belt number again, right? Right, so this here is the motor sheave. I actually went and did some research, right? <laughs> so I pull up the, the motor sheave. I, I put that same number there to give me like a highlight the number here. I knew that the number of teeth was 30. Pitch diameter was 5.26. Uh, and that is inches, I believe. Inches. So there is, sometimes there's the kind of um, investigations that are undergo for some of these um, issues. This here is the fan pulley. So I, I Pull up the fan pulley number now, and I got this right. The pitch diameter 29 point something inches, uh, number of grooves, which is also the number of teeth on the, on the pulley, is a 168. All right, this is the, um, the synchronous belt. This is the synchronous belt number now, right? I got the overall belt length. Now, if you recall um, from our previous slide, the calculate the belt frequency also need the belt length, right? But I actually prove it a different way. But you could actually prove it and next way using the belt length as well, right? But we will get to that. So I knew the number T20 belt was 225. And the belt length was um, 150 millimeters per second. Right, so there's uh, next portion of the data I pull up. There's a higher frequency data, right? So what I did, I normalized the spectral data to the 4.24 hertz signal that I was getting. So when I say normalize, what I did, I made that the fundamental frequency. So, and, I, and all other frequencies would be in forms of, in terms of orders of that fundamental frequency. So that 4.24, any frequency that I choose will be in the form of an order to that 4.24, right? That 4.24 might represent 1x, for example. So this signal here that I acquired was 225x, right? So this proved to me, right, based on the number theta I got on the belt, which is 225, that this actually coming from the belt itself. This data separate from the harmonics at the 4.24 hertz that I got earlier, right? This is actually the um, timing belt passing 
frequency. 225 times the bell rate frequency, which is the 4.24. If you notice, you can see a lot of uh, uh, sidebands there as well, right? So what I did I zoom into those sidebands, right? If you recall, when I mentioned the gear mesh frequencies and, uh, and um, show the sidebands, I'll show the sidebands um, of the pinion uh, shaft, for example, that translate to the pinion shaft. That would indicate a problem with the pinion gear. Well, these sidebands had translate to that same 4.24 hertz, which will relate to a belt issue. Right? So it's 4.24 hertz sideband around the um, this main frequency, which is the timing belt passing frequency. All right, so what I did next now is uh, uh, order normalize the fan shaft rate. So I use the fan frequency while no up the fan, it was running at uh, 320 RPM. I made that the fundamental frequency and I got 179 times the fan shaft rate at that same uh, time in belt passing frequency. So that 179, that showed me that the actual um, time in shift that he used for the fan had 179 teeth. The vendor data had 168. So from this, I was able to prove that. So, right. This data now was um, order normalized to the moto shaft rate, right? So I use the moto RPM. I made that the fundamental frequency and then uh, check how much orders of that would translate to the belt timing rate. And that was the, would have been 32, right? So the vendor data had through 30. I proved that it was 32. But the fan, um, the vendor data said 168. I proved it was 179. Actually, what's important there is the ratios. Because what I prove is the ratios remain the same. So if I take that 168, over the 30, uh, take the 179 over this 32, it would amount to uh, very similar ratios. So I guess that is what they want. They was really concerned about maintaining that ratio. Right, so um, it, the fan was took, taken out of service, right? Um, and the belt was, and belt inspection was done, right? So this was in, this is how our new belt looked like. Look at the, the profile of the belt TT. This is what a old normally worn belt would look like. And this was the actual worn belt. You can see how significant uh, this wear pattern is as compared to the new belt, or even the normally old belt. Right, so after the belt was uh, replaced and properly aligned, the amplitude dropped off significantly. And this was illustrated here. This is where the problem was encountered. And this is post the maintenance work that was done, which was the belt replacement and the alignment, right? So you see the difference in, in amplitude. The motor amperage. So where the motor amperage made a step increase it, as they replaced that belt and properly aligned the, the pulleys and so on, it dropped back down to baseline amperage which is below the yellow line. And um, yeah, that concludes my presentation here for this evening. I hope you all um, enjoyed it and I would like to entertain any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Engineer Gunai, for that presentation. No it, was, it was very detailed, very informative, full of knowledge. I took I took lots of notes. I took notes. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> right, you, did, you took me back to school. Right. So, right. so what my key take my key takeaway points were is well are right the importance of cooler fans in the general industry offshore on land general industries right I I realize how important vibration analysis as a tool could be used on cooler fans, right? Uh, the common fault and failure modes in, in, in fan systems, that was very critical and crucial to me also, 
right? Yeah. And the key parameters that you would use as an analyst to, 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 to diagnose fan problems. I think that was a very powerful case study. Yeah, right? so, yeah. so at this time, we will take we will take questions, right? So how you would do this, you will just raise your hand via the icon raise, and I would address you by your by your title. But before that, I would take dibs on the question, right? I would take the first question, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Engineer Gunai, how so based on 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 what you explain with the fan construction and and mm. the particular fan that you showed in the case study, right? Mm -hmm. I observed that the fan bearings, the top and bottom fan bearings, right? Would have, well, that would have been inaccessible to a typical technician, right? Mm. While it's running, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you didn't mention lubrication. So mm. what I was thinking, right? How do these fan owners lubricate these 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 bearings, the fan bearings? Mm -hmm. Now I know most fans would operate at a very slow speed, right? To typically like around before below, sorry, five hundred RPM, right? Yeah. So in your experience, how do they normally lubricate these bearings? And that is one question. And two, uh, what are some improvements you think could be done? Right, with regards to to providing lubrication to these type of fan fan system bearings. Right. So um typically how the typical technician would um lubricate these bearings, right? They have a, a distribution block, right? That accessible, right? Now it have um, these stainless steel tubes that run up to where the you would usually mount the nipple, right? It really have a guard there, so it's inaccessible. So it have one tube going to the lower fan bearing, one tube going to the upper fan bearing. Have a block with two nipples on it, right? So you're able to lubricate manually from that block, the upper and the lower fan bearing, right? Um, there was accent, so that's how they're able to, to lubricate it, right? There was accent with some of the improvements for, for lubrication, I mean. Well, um, well, based on your experience yeah. as a practitioner, yeah. Right? Yeah. Would you would you improve that type of lubrication method that they use, or or you think that's sufficient? Oh, okay, all right, yeah. So it have it, it have many things they could do. It have you know it have automated lubricators, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it have automated grease lubricators that where you could meter the amount of grease being um pumped to these bearings on on a time basis. That that would regulate um, the amount of grease um, being supplied to these bearings without having to worry about over greasing them or under greasing them. You also would not have to worry about um, contamination, right? Because the big problem now is the technicians now would go and manually grease it, but they grease it with from with one um, grease gun. They might go. Some technician might have an next grease gun, and that one might be contaminated. Or in the process of uh, applying grease into the grease gun before you go to the um, site to uh, lubricate it, you could, um, you could introduce contaminants. Now. So that is a, that method, what I mentioned there, with the automated lubricators is a way to, um, is a way for contamination control and avoid those, those, er those errors on the field. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you clear that up definitely. So at this time, anyone has any questions uh you could raise your hand and and i will address you uh i am seeing the shell ramsudar the shell rams yes you have the floor sir oh hi good night sir thanks um good night uh question uh, for Mr. Gunai, uh, it was a wonderful presentation, very informative. Um, these vibration analysis is always something I wanted to certify myself in. So, okay, uh, okay, and not just not just for cooling fans, but other other things too. Vibration analysis mm -hmm. is a very important thing. Um, my question basically is not 
about the presentation. I just wanted to ask is if, if it's okay for me to follow you on LinkedIn to um, get more information. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, you have, I don't know if you have access to my email or I'll get less than to submit my profile there and you could be able to add it. That, that's not a problem. And any questions that you have from there, you can, you can reach out to me. Okay, sir, because with your experience, I think uh, you, you could guide me a lot to the, the part that I actually want to go down. So, yeah. so Dishan, yeah, you, could, you could probably send me an email and you just remind me. And I would definitely share Mr. Gunai's LinkedIn uh, profile code with, with you so that you could add him for sure. Okay, okay Mr. Leston, thanks so much. And another question, um, Mr. Leston. Um, yeah, go ahead. To, to be a part of this, this um, society, right? The, mm -hmm. How do I join to be a member? Uh, by chance, uh, are you from Trinidad? Yes, sir. All right, all right. All right, so uh, that's no problem. You could, I could send you an email with the relevant documents that would be required. Generally, it's 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 a applet form, and you'll fill out your name, your experience, uh, attach your resume and relevant certifications or degrees that you might have, and and it will pass through our membership assessment committee. So. So and and they will give you feedback if you are successful. So it's a pretty easy process. So I will send you the information and that's no problem. Okay, sir. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yes, no problem. No problem. Any sure. any other question, my friends? No one have no have no questions with regards to vibration because I have lots of questions. I was just giving you all a chance. So let me know. Raise your hand. Okay, Mr. Gunai. See, yes. I will I'll kind of spark up the, the, the floor for you, right? Uh so you say so with regards, you showed that that very nice case study with the bell fold, right? Uh yeah. Uh, there's another technology, I'm not sure if you're aware, right? Uh, airborne ultrasound, structure bone ultrasound, mm -hmm. right? Right. And mm -hmm. it's made to pick up very high frequencies. Do you think with your experience, whether using airborne, the airborne module or the structure bone module, if that would be a good technique to apply for those time and bell faults? Um, Given that those techniques rely on on friction, right? Friction is one of the, the mechanisms that goes by to propagate, you know, um, ultrasound signals, right? Mm -hmm. Airborne signals. It may very well be possible that you could mount a, your probe close to the belt and mm -hmm. And, prob and and possibly pick up on that signal. But that that you would have to um, test that out yourself. So if you have anyone who have a uh, ultrasound probe of any kind, you can probably um, test it out and see. I suspect it may work. It may work. Okay. It's possible yeah. it may work. Yeah. Uh, we have an engineer, and Andre Hines. Hey, what's up, Andre? Thanks for, thanks for attending. Uh, he said, excellent trick, verifying the equipment specs by order normalizing the spectrum right. to the driver and driven component speeds. So yeah, I would exactly. gather that was a, that's not a normal, that's not a normal technique everyone would use. You were being yeah. innovative, I would say. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and this guy who mentioned that he, he knows a little something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Little something. yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Dice are, dice are a, a, a good technique to, to prove um, for example, number teeth on 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 gears and stuff like that, because you could you could get your signal or a stronger signal on the output side, but you can order normalize for the input side, and then so you prove that even on the output side uh, data. 
So that is, that is basically what I did. So I, I use data that was acquired on the on the fan and I order normalized the motor. And I just uh, verify how much teeth was on the um, on the motor pulley. Okay, okay, nice, nice. That's nice stuff. Uh, so no one else is, wants to raise their hand? I, I, I will continue with my questions because I, I find this a very interesting topic. So, so years ago, right, I would have been on an offshore facility, right, and with a cooler fan rack, right, very similar to the designs that you are explaining, right? And, and I was getting a very dominant blade pass frequency, right? So the RPM by the number of blades, right? But in the axial direction of the fan, yeah. very yeah. dominant in the axial direction of the fan. What you think could have been the the source of that? Mm. It was the axial direction. And it, it is an some... axial flow fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has some publications, or it it not it not um publicly known, but it it has some publications. Might say that that is the um the, the pitch angle adjustment is used now. So I, I would imagine mm. if we have pitch angle, the pitch angle adjustment. Mm -hmm. um is different on one blade as, as opposed to the rest right that would cause that load on balance that aerodynamic load on balance and that could cause a uh, axial response in in uh in response to that so okay it could cause some axial vibration because of mm -hmm. that oh yeah that is what i suspect it is so yeah so you but believe also also yeah. poor tracking issues could could probably cause that yeah yeah I suspect so because if you have one blade or a few blades higher than the rest, one blade lower than the rest, right? That means mm. it it would not rotate on the same rotational plane. So mm. that that blade at lower than the rest will be fighting against those that um on the same rotational plane, and it could cause a a, a kind of a moment that will cause a axial response as well. Okay, okay. There was I also got got. Well, there was a, a particular client, right? He, the brand of his blades was, yeah. to, to my memory, Mitsubishi. And mm. one of his blades ended up getting damaged. And, yeah. and he replaced it. And I think he could not source that particular brand of blade, right? Mm. So he ended up changing it with a different brand. So, yeah. so and... From there was just high vibration, especially in the yeah. blade pass, right? So mm -hmm. what you think could be the possibilities that could cause that just from no, this yeah. was a, a damaged blade and he changed yeah. it to a new blade, but it's a different brand. Mm -hmm. What you think could have caused that that level of vibration increase with your blade passing frequency? So so in that instance, if it, if it's our next brand, one of the things that I would do, I would verify that that blade had the same stiffness properties as the rest. So I, okay, I would okay. actually, yeah, I would actually mount the accelerometer. Let's like say you now install that blade. I would mm -hmm. actually mount the accelerometer on the tip of that blade and just give a light bump and see if that frequency okay. response matches the rest of the blade. If it does not, um, it, if that blade stiffer than the rest, with more flexible uh, than the rest, has less stiffness than the rest of them. And that could cause aerodynamic issues. Oh, so, so you now, now I suspect yes, you could be. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you you basically did a natural frequency test. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Like the, so the same bump that's an impact that's I looked yeah. to earlier. That is what I was talking yeah, about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you so given that, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think during your fan maintenance procedures, it would be good practice to just do a casual bump test on your on your blades yeah. to ensure that the integrity of the blade is in yeah. good condition? Yeah, yeah. I, I would do that because um, if you think about it, if the blade have a crack, mm -hmm. especially where, yeah, especially near the hub, let's say, for example, it might throw a different response than the rest of the blades. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't be able to push air like the rest of the blades do. It needs to be of a certain stiffness as well. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. If, okay. if the stiffness compromise, the blade yeah. wouldn't wouldn't be in that uh, in a rigid state to be able to push the air. I totally agree with you. Uh, so 
with regards to this, so, so sorry if I'm pounding you with it because it, you, yeah, you yeah, give yeah. me a lot to think about. It. And this is it really <laughs> and this is the session to do it, right? So so I'm asking, yeah. right? Uh, so you would know about I are you aware of the motion amplification technology? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So so I see a lot of people using the different features on it and they use it on a lot of fan systems yeah. right so yeah. do you think that's a good tool we could implement in triad so without taking off your fan you could inspect the integrity of of the blades using your motion amplification equipment do you you, you, yeah. you think that makes sense yeah yeah um with with the advancement in emotion amplification technology now they have the uh the taxing feature um mm -hmm. what you could do is um you could isolate each blade and watch the vibratory motion even while the blade is running so it, it it acts almost like a like a strobe or attack but to isolate each blade singularly and you'll be able to map the vibratory motion of the blade at, at one position and okay. it, you probably do that with each blade and if you notice more deflection on one blade than the rest one okay. blade one particular blade have much more deflection then you could suspect uh, uh you have a problem with that blade okay, okay. Yeah, yeah okay okay uh mm -hmm. this this question will be for the for the people who are interested like like mr dishel ramsura uh who is interested in 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 vibration analysis training because you displayed yeah, yeah. here now how, how powerful of a tool vibration analysis could be just in diagnosing just just fan systems and 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 right. that's just fans right so where would you advise that we do training or how could you get vibration analysis right. certification training yeah it has two main um vibration analysis bodies that do um training and examination as well there is the vibration institute and immobius institute right mm -hmm. um locally here we have a agent for Mobius Institute that is um, that have uh, strategic reliability solutions. Um, they are the um, agent for Mobius here. So uh, I would um, personally I would choose Mobius because of the um, the summary the the simulations or the graphic simulations that they have mm -hmm. make it e make a ease for learning and is okay. a is a good visual aid for especially some in the to be blue new to vibration analysis so that is the route i would go okay okay if, if, if i was a new analyst you know okay okay ah mr dishel has a question so i was i was thinking i was thinking about the lubrication right mm -hmm. um, i'm not sure if i missed this if you said this in the presentation but how do you determine what kind of lubricant to use um but there must be like depending on maybe the fan speed or um the type of cooling fan you know so you know what viscosity you're using then the viscosity of the lubrication yeah um you usually oem does have guidance on on which lubricant to use but 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 you're right is a is a function of the fan speed um as well as the load and and so on but um the oem is usually give guidance on which um lubricant uh to use but yeah okay. it, it's a function, of, a function of span speed and load yeah so the lubricant is some kind of um synthetic oil uh, mm. so like i think the there's iso standard for that Yeah, uh, suspect so. Um, what, what ISO standards for what exactly? Well, okay. Um, I'm not sure how to portray this question, mm -hmm. but you know how some cars have like 10 W to T, you know, like those types right. of stuff, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. so, the oil using that for the specific type of fan, the the lubricant you're using. Right. Um, right. Is there a type of like? For instance, how the car oil have like ten W to T or something. Uh -huh. Um 
ดีอ่ะอ่ะอ่ะอ่ะ probably มีน you know มีนไป probably ดีดีดีดีติกนะเนาะ um you have the front grades are at at thickness right right so the number two is the most common one So I suspect is is probably from a, a technical point of view. Yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. You know, they they would say EP two or something like that, man. So okay. Okay. I suspect they were talking about it. The, the number two one is the most is the most common one in the industry, right? Um, for motors, even those those fans as well. But the OEM was was usually give you the brand and the brand type, right? So, right. Yeah, and it it also have a lubricant selection guideline you, you you could use as well that um that rates the 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 rotational speed, the load, and all that. It take all that into consideration, and you, the materials, everything, the, the bearing material, everything. Okay. okay. Right. I will see. I will see if we could we could get our document for you. Right. Okay. Right. Is our, yeah, is our lubrication selection guideline. That that is really where weight is. So let's like, say if you had a, a choose a lubricant, but you're not sure which one to use, is that then selection guideline you may have to follow. Okay, sir. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, we will see if um talk the lesson. We will we'll um see if you we'll submit a document if you want. Right. Okay, sir. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, oh, we have Mr. Mr. Bansi. You can take the floor. Yeah, after on written, yeah. Sure. After, after um, after presenter, after. Um, engineer, you indicated yeah. earlier that how yeah. um, a substitute blade was used, but my yeah. asset is down and I have no alternative blade. Mm -hmm. How can I get it running? Yeah, you have the asset is down and you have no alternative blade. How you gonna get it running? Yeah, I mean the original yeah. uh, supply of yeah. the blade. Right. Mm, yeah, so yeah. my my equipment is twenty years old. We supply a lot of business. Mm. I wouldn't want to call the, the company you called earlier for marketing yeah. purposes. Yeah. Right. So I need I put in a substitute and I get mm. my vibration. What am I going to do? The plan down. Yeah. I if you are a substitute blade running and I assess the vibration, I'll I'll check to see if at least if within limits. If it within limits, we had to buy, use that, and buy some time until we could get it correctly. If it not within limits, you may have no choice but to take it out as it is. Depending on 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 the amplitude of vibration, because it could cause cause it could cause a worse problem. So Miss Balance didn't come into play, but do you think it may yeah. be wise to put a counter blade, mm -hmm. medium change two or four, if, opposite if, ninety if not, degrees? Yeah, if you have a next one of those blades, possibly, possibly. But but the thing is, those two blades now will be at different stiffness properties at the rest. So it would it would respond a little front, but that mm -hmm. might be a little better. Yeah, to to put one opposite, For right? Counterbalance. No. Mm -hmm. To counterbalance it. Yeah, and eventually, yeah. probably, if you look at that light span, eventually you would have probably changed all the blades sometime. Yeah. Instead of that, instead of shutting down might, my asset. Yeah, that might work. So if if you're doing that, I would assess the vibration um, amplitudes and show it within limits, and I could we could possibly do that for the time being until we could get the right blade. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Thanks, sir, Mr. Mr. Banzi. I'm sorry for joining late, but you know traffic is. So. Yeah, no problem, no problem, man. Oh, I understand man. that I had CPL tonight and stuff, so. so. <laughs> oh. Probably right. talk cricket fans. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? No one else. Well. Yeah, just on a side note, I put the um. Yeah, yeah. The, web, the website link for Appet and the application form. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, yeah. Engineer Banzi. Yeah. Uh, Joshua. Uh, the shell, you could, you could probably, right? You, you, you could use these links and you could get it, right? So you I could. 
Uh, fill out your application form. Mr. Joshua. Yeah. You have the floor. Joshua, Mr. Joshua Subesh. Yes, you have I, the floor. Um, I just had one question um, about um, some of the challenges you might have in gathering your data. I know sometimes it seems like you're really good at analyzing that data, but if you don't gather any data, if, if, if you're still having problems with your data, what are some of the challenges in terms of gathering data for analysis? All right, where, where some of the challenges from gathering data you talking about? You mean vibration data, right? Yeah, yeah, particularly vibration. Some of the challenges, right. Well, one of the main challenges you encounter, especially with these school infants, is that you do have, do have access to the bearings itself, right? So sometimes the bearing is be up over the guard, right, and just under the blade. So you do have access to the actual bearing location, which which optimal because you want the best uh, signal response, right? So um, what you do to, to counteract that challenge is take any next best point you could, which would be on a bolt. Sometimes the bolts just be exposed, right? Now the bolt have a direct contact to the housing because that is what's securing the housing in place. And so it's really about transmissibility, right? So the, the bearing, um the rolling elements of the bearing making contact now that will transmit to the the outer race to the housing and then transmit through the bolts that way i can mount the accelerometer on so your next best bet will be the bolts that is, that is one of the challenges is is that the inaccessibility of the bearing house it, itself right yeah that, that is the main um challenge you might encounter there but with, with collecting data. Yeah. Uh, Joshua, are you still there? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, uh, huh. I appreciate that uh, explanation there. Yeah. This is a feel that is new to me, so I'm still learning a lot. Oh. I a lot here, and I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, no problem. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for attending. Uh, Mr. Dichel, do you have another question? Um, yes, sir. One more question, right? Um, this, with, with respect to the vibration analysis, right, on the industrial cooling fans, how regularly is this conducted? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. What's yeah, your... Yeah. What, What's your? I I'm assuming he's saying or oh, he's asking what's the what's the frequency right. you would do analysis right. and and acquire yeah. data on these systems? Yeah. right. So so um, Dishal, you know, sometimes that is uh, depend on on how frequently you encounter problems, right? With these um with these fans, sometimes right. um some problems is occur very much or much more often than others. Those they require more uh, frequent monitoring, right? Sometimes um, in condition monitoring, eh, once you uh, get a graph of the fault and you're able to, to correct it, or at least correct some of the root causes partially, and you do have those frequency of failures, you could uh, kind of sort of extend the time between um, your, your tests, right? Um, right? But typically, a one month, every, a once a month should be sufficient as a rule at all. Every month. Okay. Yeah. So this this occurs like when as a scheduled maintenance then once a month or you all mm -hmm. just monitor by the behavior and the or the runtime of right. this um it, it could work like that sometimes we, we just go by the um by the condition so let's like say i collect data this time around i realize that i have a bearing issue but i don't want to shut it down yet Right, but I realize this bearing issue now it's getting worse. I might take that one month and cut it to two weeks. So I would say, well, every two weeks we will monitor this, right? So our next fan now, we probably haven't encountered an issue on that fan in quite some time. I might extend the period between uh, between tests. That is just to, to optimum to optimize your 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 schedule for where you want to collect data and, and what to collect data on, what not to collect data on, you know. So you gotta collect data. What more worth your time, you know? 
So that's okay. how you could do it. You could go based on your current condition of the machine itself as well. Okay, sir. Thanks. Yeah. So, Engineer Gunai, based on what you said, uh, you're basically saying, well, not basically, but you are saying that you should have an idea of the PF interval of your different fold modes. Yeah, yeah. And you schedule so, your, your, your visits or your data acquisition maintenance procedures within that PF window. interval. Yeah. yeah. Or window. All right. Yeah, right. yeah. In that window, yeah. Yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Joshua, do, do you have another question? No, no, I'm not sure. No, it's still up there. Okay, so right, no problem. Uh, well, Mr. Gunai, Engineer yeah. Gunai, well, it looks like like we are going to ah, we we have a Mr. American. Oh, Mr. American, how how could we miss him? Mr. Mr. Khan, you have good the evening, floor. Man. Good evening, good evening. Uh, Engineer Gunai, I just have one question, right? Um, throughout your True. years of experience, um, what has been the most common causes of uh, vibration in coolant tower fans? And is it mm. that there are particular causes for these equipments? Offshore compared to onshore ones. Right. So one of the most common fault modes, that is what you're asking, right? One of the most common fault modes. I would say it all is come back down to the bearing. <laughs> bearing faults is probably the most common. And only because uh you could easily contaminate a bearing during the greasing process and, and stuff like that, right? During the lubrication process. So is is where you store your lubricants, how you dispense it. If you have clean um the grease guns that you're using, you know, um if you over grease, if you under grease. So a lot could go wrong during the lubrication process, and therefore bearings might prove to be the most common issue, bearing issues, the um bearing wear issues, right? So um offshore as opposed to land, right? One of this offshore is um you have high wind conditions right so if you recall i was talking about the the blade passing frequencies and how that could lend itself to indicate uh aerodynamic issue or airflow issue right so what i've noticed is that a lot of the cooling fans um where it have high winds with high wind conditions they tend to have higher vibration levels so sometimes that is the, the challenges that you encounter so one one visit you might encounter a very high amplitude vibration on, on a fan, and next visit, it might be a calm day and the vibration levels much lower. And in, in fact, the, the API standard, I think that is 661, indicate that your test fan vibration under wind conditions of under 10 miles per hour, I believe. And they, 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 they mentioned that for a reason, because they noticed the, the high wind conditions is influence uh, the vibration levels significantly, probably particularly the blade pass frequency um, amplitude. So yeah, but both on land and offshore, lubrication problems. That is so number one, the bearing, bearing issues. Mr. Amir, uh, no. engineer Amir, you had a second question within that. Uh, no, I think he answered it. Um, oh, I just like it. to ask one follow-up question, however. Um, you have what to flow, advice you would, what advice would you give to young upcoming professionals that are entering, mm. you know, this mm. field of asset management? Mm. I would say do a lot of research, do a reading, know where you want to um get into and make sure you pursue it right um do try to dabble in too much as a uh, uh, different um disciplines but if it you know you want to stick with within the field try and hone your skill within the field right 
Then who na who ni skill with any field and become good at it? Guys, what are they do? Only ends up at work. Visit a uh, you know forums. Um, if you if you can a lot of um, conventions and so on. I have a lot of uh, online um, publications. All those different things, seminars. Um, stuff like this, like this seminar tonight, you know, attend a, a lot of these things and hone your skill. Yeah, that is basically it. Engineer Amir, thank you. Thank you for that question. And and Engineer Gunai, thank you for your for that response because I totally agree because I I witness a, a lot a lot of young people uh they are looking for for where to go what's the direction to go in and and yeah. and a lot a, a lot of them they're just doing certifications like crazy this year yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah, they're not doing specializing in anything, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so so nothing is wrong with with gaining knowledge but but what we have to remember folks is that these are practitioners practitioner certifications which means that you should be practicing so if you are if you are not in the position to practice, right? Don't be going around just jumping. Know what you want to do, whether it's rotating or static, right? Nothing is wrong with knowledge base, right? But 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 know know what know where your passion is, and hone your attention there, and and yeah. and hone that skill set and specialize because too much times we 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 enter into the industry. With being a jack of all trades and the master of none, and I could tell you from experience, problems do not, they are not a respecter of skill set. A pipeline or a machine is not going to say, hey, Christopher Gunai is a category one. I'm going to vibrate like a category one. No, it's going to vibrate in the worst way possible. And in that worst way, it might take a category four, category three to figure it out. Vibration analyst. So, so. Yeah. So that's my observations generally with the with the industry. Stick to stick to to your to your passion and and hone it and specialize. Not, nothing is wrong with, with with doing reading or research or you do a certification for for let's say knowledge, right? No problem. But just keep in mind these are practitioner certifications. And if you're doing it for a job, let's say. Just know that when you enter that interview, right, they are going to be asking you, tell me about a time. Tell me about a time that you solve a problem using this weather. And if you have not practiced, you will not have a time. You will not yeah. have that in your memory. And you might have to resort to making up stories, which is a no-no in an interview mm. process. So, so that's my advice. But thank yeah, you, means, Engineer yeah. Amir, for bringing that up. Good question. Yeah, thanks, Amir. No problem, guys. Thanks for sharing the info freely as usual. Yeah, no problem. So, Mr. Engineer Gunai, do you have any last words to ask? I mean, to, sorry, to add before we close off our session? Oh, I um, should be good there. If anyone have any questions, uh, anybody have one more question, I could entertain it now. Take your shot. Last call, come, last call. Come. Comment Mr. Bansi. Oh, it's Mr. not really Bansi. a question. Is uh, based on the. I know I joined late, right? Uh, but based on the question area from the young ones, right? You should probably. Uh, I'm not sure if you have it in the pipeline. Send out a feedback, and if they want uh, a second session, um, because you gain some interesting queries from the young ones. Yeah. And as you already said, yeah. there the passion we, you you yourself as the chair for the division will get a feedback. What was the benefit of this session, and if there's a follow up one? Okay. Second one, you mentioned the passion, which is quite correct. But certificated is not educated, as I always was mentioned, right? So you may have a not a lot of certificate for flat house, and you have no foundation for multi story. So you mentioned there. Yeah, for them to take the passion and go in depth in whatever they're doing, which is quite correct. But in any organization, they're not only looking for certificate, 
they're looking for something which you call competence and you could only develop that from getting your hands dirty in the area. Correct, is right? Yeah, yep. Uh, and if they want to go in depth, they know what to find. Yeah, this is this is former, former, well, past president, engineer to generate Bansi, past mechanical chair. So so he knows what he's talking about. Lecturing you, so so this is just wisdom and knowledge passing on here. Thanks a lot, Engineer Banzi. No problem. So, with that being said, folks, uh, ah, Shilon. Sh Shilon, you have the floor. Your quarters here, hey. your quarter just in time. Yeah, no, I, I just want to add, um, good night, um. Uh, engineer Christopher and Asana, I think that this is a really good session that you all had. I mean, coming from myself um, in the industry a few years now, this is really good information um, that you are sharing for the general um, public itself. So I think um, you should definitely do like different um, subsections, like different areas of um, equipment. Mm -hmm. Because each, as you know, each equipment has its own uniqueness with its own, um, if it's continuous monitoring or handheld vibration monitoring. So, I mean, like, th th this is, uh, I think this is a good session. So, thanks for having it. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Thank you thanks, for joining thanks us. A lot. Shalon, I want to ask you a question. Are you willing to pay for a session like this if it's $200 or $300? You mean as, as, um, I mean, yes. I mean, yeah, it's valuable, yeah. And looking at it as um, CPDs, Continuous Professional Development Units, for you to add to your profile and your association, this is just feedback we want from the clientele. And do you prefer a session like this being online versus face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I mean, both, ha both has its um, advantages and disadvantages like online uh, versus in person. So I think based on the feedback from everyone, you can make a decision on that. Um, Why well, I asked on the basis that how, what I observed here probably, I, well, I know I joined late, right? Um, It was probably 35 minutes lecture, but the real gist of it came from the Q&A, which was the networking. On that basis, I will ask if it is better for face-to-face. -face. Not only the sharing of knowledge, but the based on the one-on-one -on -one discussion you may have with other members, how much we have here, 15, 17 percent had earlier. On that basis, I'll ask that. It's food for thought for the current chair and the executive. Back to you, chair. Good night. Correct. Good night, Engineer Mansi. <laughs> Correct is right. Thank you for thank you for your contribution. Shalom, Shalom, sorry. Uh, thank you, Engineer Bansi. Thank you, everyone, everyone for attending. Thank you, especially Engineer Gunai, Engineer Christopher Gunai, for your time, your knowledge, your wisdom, your experiences. It is definitely heartfelt, and, and, and we will hold it close. Hope to have you again. Thanks a lot, Lester. No problem. Thanks a lot, everyone, and have a safe and, and have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone.